Um, the roadshow began with the intention that NHH would visit all regions of the state after so many years of Zoom and reconnect with all of their supporters, the people who attend our programs, who host them, or who help facilitate them. So on behalf of New Hampshire Humanities staff and board, thank you for joining us tonight as we explore how an old Hollywood film captured one, family, one New Hampshire family story. Across this year, New Hampshire Humanities is going to be focused on the theme of stories, exploring how stories are told, whose are shared, and then questioning which stories are missing. From my perspective at NHH, this has seemed like a particularly timely moment to reflect on the stories that we tell about ourselves, our state, and our nation. This year, Portsmouth celebrates the 400th anniversary of its founding, and in two years, the United States will celebrate the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And while 1623 and 1776 might sound like dates that you had to memorize for your eighth grade history test, they also mark the beginning of larger stories that we tell about the founding of our state and our nation. And of course, perhaps most interest interestingly, people have complex stories and experiences of their own that when shared can challenge how we think about some of these broader narratives. So we are opening this conversation about the stories we tell, exploring by, by exploring the many ways that they're shared, whether through oral traditions, as Anne Jennison showed us last week in Portsmouth, through films, as we're looking at tonight, or through song, writing, and dance, which we'll explore in upcoming events in the Roadshow this spring. Um, and before the program begins, I also want to take one final moment to thank Hypotherm, our Roadshow sponsor, with additional support from Andrea Williamson, financial advisor at Edward Jones, as well as our annual partners. Um, this includes the Leslie Center for the Humanities at Dartmouth College, Northeast Delta Dental, and our media partners, New Hampshire Public Radio and New Hampshire Public Television, as well as obviously the National Endowment for the Humanities. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Larry Baniquist, who will speak briefly about the film, Lost Boundaries, and then after the film ends, we invite you to stay for a Q&A with Larry as well. Larry Beniquist is a professor emeritus at Keene State College and founder of the college's film studies program, a filmmaker, and a film historian. In 1989, he orchestrated the Lost Boundaries reunion at Keene State, which drew over 1,500 people. In attendance were members of the Johnston and DeRochemont families, the production team, and the surviving actors from the film, including Mel Ferrer and Carleton Carpenter. Um, NPR, The Washington Post, and other news media provided coverage. And in 1990, NHP, NHPBS produced a documentary on the um, film called Home to Keene, The Lost Boundaries Reunion. We are so honored to have him here again tonight and to return to discuss the film. So Larry, take it away. Well, this is an honor to be here. And it's about a, uh, a black family in Keene who uh, a physician and his wife and children who were passing for white and then he was um, discovered to be black during the Second World War when, when he tried to enlist as, a, as an officer, a medical officer in the Pacific Campaign and did a background check on him and discovered he had been in an African-American fraternity at, his, uh, um, at the Rush School of Medicine in Chicago where he, he became a physician and they took away his commission. And then the community found out that they had a black doctor. But mo maybe more importantly, in some ways, from the point of view of this film, the children found out. They didn't know. Of course, the, f the family had been passing. So um, Agnes, uh, Doris gave me the name of the film. And I went and found it and started to show it, and then bought my own print because it was just got too difficult to, to keep renting it. And in 1988, the good doctor passed away. In 1966, they had moved from, from Keene to Hawaii. And the reason being, life would be easier for them there. Things had not been easy in Keene once they were outed as being African American. Um, by 1949, 1950, the uh, people who were running the local hospital were actively trying to get rid of them. And by June of 1953, he had lost his hospital privileges. And so he would set up, he was the first x-ray, he was the first black man to graduate from Harvard's Rentgenology x-ray program. Um, and that's what he practiced in Keene. I mean, historical from that point of view. So 
so I was showing this film in class, and, and students would think, boy, this is great. Uh, a lot of them came to Keene and didn't know why they came here other than for the college and maybe because skiing was going on around it. And, and here was this, this, this important event that had, that had taken place. So in 1988, when the doctor died, the family got in touch with me through a, a weird circumstance that would take me too long to explain that I owned a print of the film. They had never seen the film, many members of the family, because as I said, VHS tape wasn't invented. It hadn't, it hadn't been shown yet on television. So I, I said, uh, so the funeral's taking place this weekend in Keene? They said, yes. People were there from Hawaii, from Paris, from Miami for the funeral of the doctor. He's going to be buried in the Catholic cemetery in, in Keene. Although during his lifetime, they had been practicing congregationalists because, as, you'll, as we'll talk about afterwards, um, when he first landed in New Hampshire and, and was in Gorham, where, where he practiced before he became a radiologist, um, Neither Catholics nor blacks were very popular. In fact, there was a, a, a Gorham, while he was there, set up a KKK chapter. <laughs> but he was never outed, and he thanked God for that. But then after he went to uh, Harvard to, um, to learn to be a radiologist, then he, when he came back, he moved to Keene, still passing for white, and set up business in Keene. So I took my print. And after the funeral, I didn't go to the funeral, I went down to Buzzards Bay where everybody was, was assembled at, he had four children, the youngest son, and, and, and uh, was invited down to show the film at a family reunion just before everybody was taking off. So I went down with my 16 millimeter projector and the film, drove to Buzzards Bay, and what I saw was, this was taken at that day in 1988, there's the family. I'll leave this up later so you can see it. Just average American family all together. At the funeral had taken place. This was Monday night. The next day they were about to leave. And I came in with my projector and a screen and the film. And at first, M Mrs. Johnson was a little bit suspicious of me. I don't blame her. They'd had a rough life over all this. She said, what's your interest in this, Mr. Benequist? And I said, well, I'm a teacher, and I, I'd like to know the background of all these things. I have no ulterior motive. I said, I, I think your family's amazing, from what I can tell in the film and what I've learned. So she accepted that, and they were having a cookout in the backyard, a barbecue. And we, I ate with them, and then we went in the house. When it got dark, I set up the screen and the projector, and she had sat next to me while I was showing the film. And as a film unreal, she would every once in a while tap me on the knee and say, that really happened. It, it was great. That racist nurse really did throw that bottle of blood on the floor and smash it because it came from a black man. And she didn't want any white man to have it. And you'll see that in the film. And her family was assembled. They were sitting on the floor. A uh, fisherman from Cape Cod. Uh, she still lives in Brothers Bay. The only son who's still alive is uh, Paul. And um, he's, he's, he's pretty feeble now. Uh, Jody was from Keene. She passed away. I, as I said, I knew some of these people, but I didn't know the connection. I had no way of knowing. It wasn't something that people talked about a lot. So after the film, the, I turned on the lights. Somebody turned on the lights, and the room was very quiet, except Jody, one of the granddaughters, was crying. And um, her, co her cousin, Susan, came over to her to call. And Mrs. Johnston said, why are you crying, Jody? What is it? And she said, I, I don't know. After seeing this film, which I've never seen before, I don't know. Am I, am I white? Am I black? What am I? She said, you know, I would go to school in Troy, Troy, New Hampshire. She said, I was in school there. And, and when they got to civics, the teacher would say, now we have an example of a Negro in our class. Jody, would you stand up and let everybody look at you? <laughs> and, and then she started to cry. And Susan went over to comfort her, her cousin. And, and then Mrs. Johnston turned to her family and said, um, how about you, uh, Albert, Albert Jr.? What are your, and he talked about his own experiences and so forth, rather than get into detail about it. And I quickly saw that what was going to unfold that evening was almost a lesson in American civil rights that was taking place before my eyes. And I felt like an intruder, I really did. So after that point, uh, I put everything in the car 
and started to drive back, and my wife, who was with me, who does not cry easily, was weeping for half the ride back. The intensity of what we experienced, this little family, and what they had experienced in our, our culture just it was overwhelming. I to think about it, you know. She let me take the pictures. I mean, she trusted me, and that meant a lot to me. We became friends. I wrote to her, and then in 1989, early 1989, I realized it was going to be the 40th year after this film was released. It won a Cannes Film Festival Award. It won uh, New York Times Best uh, uh, Viewers Awards, other things. It was the first film to come out of Hollywood, uh, even though it was filmed in Portsmouth and Maine. Uh, De Rochemont, who had won two Academy Awards, I'll tell you later how he got into the story of it, uh, how he even learned about it. Um, it was the first mainstream film to treat blacks as autonomous human beings and treat African Americans as folks who aren't just attached to some white family in some uh, uh, um, inferior capacity, but they had lives of their own. And as true as you watch the film, you'll see that it's the leads are white, Mel Ferrer, a white actor, Beatrice Pearson, she only made two films. Um, all these actors, the lead actors were white, that's true. He wanted to get an audience, he knew America. I mean, he started the March of Time series that got him an Academy Award in 1935. De Rochemont lived in Newington, New Hampshire, he won two Academy Awards. He had a, uh, an instinct, a sensibility for things that were happening in public that, um, that that's the reason he got the award. He's, he's, he, there's a direct line between what he did with, with um, March of Time and 60 Minutes today. Long form journalism, that was his invention. No one had done that before. And so once he, he turned that over to his brother in 1942, he started his own production company. And this was the third film he had done. Before that, it was films with Jimmy Cagney and others. And this film he wanted to make because he had met the family. I'm going to tell you about that later. So um, we held our reunion uh, in uh, July of 1989. Uh, Thyra Johnston got in touch with Mel Ferrer. He called me up in my office and he said, ah, I understand you're going to be having a reunion there of Lost Boundaries. He said, that was the most important film I ever did, you know. You know that, don't you? He said, how can I help? And so Mel Ferrer, at his own expense, brought his family out. At the time, he was not married to Audrey Hepburn. This was later. And, and stayed for several days. 1,500 people came to see this film. And it, it wasn't anything I did as much as setting it up something that had touched a nerve that I hadn't even expected. And it was, it was an overwhelming experience for all of us. Um, I'm sorry we don't have time to watch the 25-minute documentary on it, but it's, it's often and with something that could, we could work out some other time. But um, so this is the film that uh, I sat and watched with Thyra and her family back in the summer of 1988, and uh, see what you think of it. Uh, any questions you have afterwards, we can talk. Um, I want to recommend before we go, though, because some of you might leave. This is a book by Professor Allison Hobbs, H-O-B-B-S, A Chosen Exile. It's about the history of passing in the United States. She devotes 50 pages of this book to the Lost Boundaries Re Reunion, New Hampshire, and the events that, that took place. And it's an excellent, excellent survey of, of the difference between what Life Magazine was saying about how people in Keene accepted this family and the reality of it, which we can talk about later. So with that, um, I think enjoy is the word, because it's a good film. I mean, the, the reason he shows white actors, the re see, there's nothing about race on this poster, is there? It's a guy looking at his hands, and you'll see that in the film. If you wanted to get an audience to come to a film in America, you have to make it appeal to the Reader's Digest group. You have to. And that's, that's exactly what happened. In 1947, the Reader's Digest article came out. In 1948, this book. In 1949, the film. So that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. So <laughs> I'll move this poster out of the way. And, uh,
Yes, sir. Um, I have uh, two questions. One kind of a simple one. Why did they choose to change the name of the town to Keenum? And secondly, and you've sort of already answered this, the movie ends on kind of a high note, and I was wondering if that's really reflective of what happened, and if it's not, why did the filmmaker choose to end it that way? I think at first, um, Dr. Johnston told people that he didn't receive the commission because of physical disabilities. But if you look at the paperwork, which is in the Historical Society of Cheshire County, all the original letters, he kept applying. He, went, he applied to the, post, the Coast Guard, the Army Air Force, the Navy again, um, and the Marines, everything. And the letters, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too short, you're too tall. I mean, they were all contradictory with each other. And they just didn't want them. But, you know, as far as the community was concerned, for a while, year or two, he was, um, they rescinded his commission because of physical disabilities. But he told his son the truth. It just kind of slipped out and um, asked, asked him not to tell, tell the others. It wasn't until 1947 when Albert Jr. was a student at the University of New Hampshire and he was in a black fraternity. He had come to terms with his heritage and he had heard about this famous filmmaker named Louis de Rochemont who lived over in, New in uh, Newington and went over and said wait, with his friends. One day he made an appointment through a dean at the University of New Hampshire. And he went over and, and uh, made an appointment and went in with, a, with two or three of his fraternity brothers. And Louis de Rochemont said, what can I do for you boys? And they said, well, you make, Hollywood makes films about famous white people all the time. What about films about famous black people like George Washington Carver or Frederick Douglass? And he mentioned a bunch of them. And according to this is a story that Albert told me. He said, de Rochemont turned to me and he said, well, I can understand why these guys are asking this question. Why are you here? You're a white kid. And <laughs> then Albert uh, Jr. told him the story of his family and immediately de Rochemont's receptors went up, you know, a story. He, he saw something, he was good at this. During, during the Second World War, he always knew when something was gonna go on someplace, he would send out crews. So once he heard the whole story, he said, if you could get your family to agree to write this down and give me permission to work with it, I'll submit it to the Reader's Digest to have a relationship with them, the R RDDR Corporation. And if they print it as a story and now, then we'll, maybe we'll turn it into a film. Well, Albert was so excited at the prospect of this, he hitchhiked back to Keene and told his parents about the offer that um, Louis de Rochemont had made. And according to Thyra, the widow, she told me that, that they sat up all night talking about this. Do we go public with this? Well, very few people in the community really had it figured out. This was 1947. And Thyra said it was her idea. She said it was time. It was time we had to stop hiding and stop doing this. So we have one of the copies of the original release form at our, in our collection that, uh, that he signed. He uh, gave it to de Rochemont. De Rochemont sent it off to um, a writer in um, Kansas, E.B. H.L. White, I think that's his name, wrote this book. And W.L. White, it was turned into a, a first the Reader's Digest, a long story. In fact, it was the first time that the Reader's Digest had been asked to, remember we used to be able to buy reprints to pass out to people, like well, it's five cents each, 10 cents. This was the first time they had done that. Everybody wanted to read this story. The next year the book came out and then the film. My theory is when the film came out, that's when certain class of people in Keene really got nervous about, about this. A Look Magazine, Life Magazine, Ebony Magazine, all portrayed, not, not you know, this is a forward progressive thing to do. Keene is really doing something very special here. And it's true that most of the people in Keene, I've talked to a lot of them, didn't care. But you know which class did care? The upper classes in Keene. They, they were called the Court Street Gang. And 
I've, I managed to get into the hospital archives. I couldn't get into the doctor's records of their meetings, but I was allowed to look at the, um, the, the board, board of directors, board of trustees me, me, uh, meeting uh, minutes. And meeting after meeting, they were trying to get rid of the doctor. They said he was scamming money from them. He was doing this. He was doing that. And the doctors that stood up for him were doctors Fox and Dr. Daniels, Jonathan Daniels' father. And they stuck with him. But suddenly, um, by the summer of 1953, everything turned around. By June of 1953, he had lost his, his, his hospital pr privileges. And he just had to work out of his own home, which he did. He set up a clinic in his house. I think in Peterborough, he had one as well, other equipment. I think over in Vermont as well. And he, he put it together. And he had a lot of loyal patients. But when you talk to the people in Keene who, who still hold him in great regard, they tend not to be from, you know, like Keene's like any other community, as you heard in the film. I mean, the, the upper class in Keene are the people who sell real estate and are the lawyers and the doctors and, you know, all those people. And everybody else is everybody else. They loved him. But I know after, after we had the reunion, um, I went to interview one of the old doctors and knew him, a man I respected greatly. And I sat down with him and I said, what did you think of Dr. Johnson? He said, it took us a while, but we finally got rid of him, you know. And then I was invited to a, a, a woman's home in West Keene who was a member of a very old family in Keene. She had a couple of film programs she wanted to give me. So I asked her if she knew the Johnsons. She said, oh, yeah, we used to go play cards with them. But we always knew they were Negroes. I said, what, what do you mean? She said, well, well, Thyra Johnston came into the room to play bridge. You could tell she was black because her arms hung down by her sides like a orangutan. <laughs> now, this was a woman from one of the oldest families in Keene. You know? So I, I, it, it didn't take me thinking about this a whole lot to realize what had happened. They, you know, they must have felt betrayed. But what Dr. Johnston did, he really changed from, he was, he was starting to drink, he was hiding out. But once the movie was made, he decided that he was going to, he, you know, with the NAACP's help, he gave talks throughout um, the Northeast as far, as far uh, west as um, Pittsburgh. And some, some of the uh, copies of some of the speeches that he gave still exist. They're in a collection. And he says at one point, in 19, a speech he gave in Pittsburgh in 1950, uh, 50, that if America did not solve its racial problem, there was going to be a huge conflagration, likes of which he'd never seen. This was a man who had been hiding out before. So anyway, kind of answers it, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for the question. It was, yep. That's true. But I, yeah, it does, doesn't it? I mean, Keene suddenly, I mean, the film reveals a significant number of people in Keene as racists in a way, but not everybody. I mean, people in Keene, I think some people found it embarrassing. Yet, the film played at the Scenic Theater for several weeks and packed the place, you know. But I, I, I'll put it bluntly. I don't think these people in Keene minded having a Negro doctor. They didn't want a famous Negro doctor. <laughs> See what I mean? That's what I think. It's just, you know. Pardon? We asked why they changed oh. the name. Uh, why they changed the name? The name, yes. All right. Well, you know, I found in the archives um, fan letters that Dr. Carter in Keenum, New Hampshire, actually got to Keene. <laughs> and the one, one from a young woman in, in uh, Philadelphia, she says, I'm 19 years old, and I'm very pretty, and I have a very pretty figure, and I'd like to meet you, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Carter. So you, it's, it was, I think, for legal reasons, maybe to protect the family. Keenum is, a, is a, an amalgam of Gorham and Keene, because he was in Gorham first and Keene. So they kind of put it together. I think that's probably the reason. Um, but it's a melodrama. It's just, it's just a domestic melodrama. One of a million films, you can see from the poster, there's nothing on here that would indicate race. It's a mystery. But that's, people went to see it. They recognized the names of some of the leads, and they knew that, um, hey, we're going to get a good story. It played for six months at the Astor Theater in, in midtown Manhattan as a, a standalone. I've got a picture of, of a crowd in my, the volume that I brought with me. Six months. Right next to it was showing... Um, um, it was a streetcar named Desire. Some, 
some other film next to it. So film started to change, and, and this, this was the first of a group of films that came out that really tried to address the country's racial issues. You know, Pinky, Home of the Brave, um, you know, others dealing with, with uh, issues of, of um, anti-Semitism. Suddenly after the war, people thought maybe things will change. You know, we fought this war for a reason. <laughs> And Jews and blacks and everybody fought, fought overseas for freedom. Why can we get it? Well, let's try for it, you know. But De Rochemont, he was amazing. I mean, he, you know, yeah, I really think so. He took a big, and this film was banned in um, Memphis and Atlanta, and that didn't bother De Rochemont at all. He, <laughs> he loved a lawsuit, and he just, you know, but it was never shown in those cities. Um, but it was shown in the rest of the country. In the South, when U Universal Studios would have the most liberal newsreels, when they would be sent South, and they had an article in there showing black people in even a slightly positive light, the films would come back to the depot with that part cut out and thrown away. Because they wouldn't even allow it to be shown on the screen in the big cities in, in, in the South. You know, So, yeah. <laughs> More questions, yes sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Walked out of the church and the daughter. The daughter, yes. Yes. Yeah, I met her. Um, she lived in Connecticut. Um, there were four children in reality, as opposed to the two that you see in the film. Um, do you mean what happened to her? Why did she leave the church? I mean, the scene, her leaving the church, what was the, the direction there, and what was she going to be doing? Uh, did they... They sort of left that. They did. I think the humiliation of what they, the family was going through and what she had to look for, had, had to. I mean, she just walks out alone. The film ends on not a pos you know, you have four people ringing the bell, but that's not going to make up for, for the pain that this family knew they were going to endure and was not going to go away very quickly. I mean, de Rochemont wasn't a liberal, he wasn't a, a, a conservative, he was a progressive, but he was a realist. He knew a good story. And he believed in Yankee values and the, and the American uh, experiment. And his, his work all deals with that. Um, and that's why he, films, he had so many films that he did in New England. He saw this as kind of a repository of values. He was born in Massachusetts, then later moved to England, loved the Navy, had been in the Navy. so. Oh, please, more, yeah. Ask away. If I can answer it, I will. Yeah, I'll go halfway. Thank you. So anyhow, I thought the film was a wonderful film, and it was, uh, uh, it, it's, it's amazing that it was made at the time it was made. Uh, I don't think that film could be shown in Florida today. <laughs> <laughs> At least not in the no. schools. It's too. It's, I'm afraid it's too woke. It's <laughs> but, a woke. But a you woke know, it, film. it remind, the period of time reminds me of the believe it or not the Nashua Dodgers in 1950, 49, 50, when Roy Campanella and Don Newcomb were there under the tutelage of Walter Alston, and they loved it. They were treated so beautifully in Nashua. Um, they were there, I think, maybe for two years, actually. Uh, so the, co the contrast is Yeah, uh, yeah I understand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um. You said you were going to explain why they moved to Hawaii. Yeah. OK. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. OK. They, they did all right in Keene. After 1953, and they lost the hospital privileges, they survived. They did all right. Uh, the family dispersed. Um, the reason, Thyra said they moved to Hawaii for two reasons. Uh, one, he wanted to get away from the winners. <laughs> but also, he said integration had already taken place there, racially speaking. Uh, uh, integration amongst uh, many different um, racial groups, the, the Polynesians and the Koreans and the Japanese and the, and the Anglos, as it were, you know, all of that uh, had taken place. They thought they'd feel more comfortable there is what she told me. And he, wasn't, he didn't go over there to work. He wasn't going to do that. But 
they needed a radiologist, so he sent had all of his equipment sent over, and he set up shop over there and, and ran it until just before he died in 1988. So that's why they moved to Hawaii. That's what that that's what um, that's what Thyra said. Uh, the film uh, obviously had a uh, a release outside of the theaters. I I remember seeing this, and it had to have been in the very late 40s or the early early 50s uh, outdoors at the Episcopal Church Fair in Derry, New Hampshire. Really? Wow. So talk a little bit more about that. What did you? Well, uh, you know, Derry wasn't very big at that time. There were only right. a population of five or 6,000. And uh, the Episcopal Church was a, small, was a small church, but we lived next door. And they always had a uh, a big fair on the lawn every summer. And um, at one point, uh, this film uh, this film was shown there outdoors after dark. Do you remember the year? Uh, I graduated high school in 1956, and it was before that. Okay. The reason I mention that is I've heard stories about. Um about de Rochemont filming the Dairy Fair. I don't know if that footage has ever been found or not, but but yeah. Yeah, so it's possible that it was shown outdoors. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, um, my question is, when they did the Waldorf mural project a few years ago, Dr. Johnson's work Yes. Some uh, some negative, perhaps. Right, that the family wasn't consulted and there were members of the family. Well, that's I ironic. I've heard that too. But I know that Susan Johnson Mitchell, her children and other relatives were there during the dedication of it. So, I find I, people are always going to take exception to something. I can understand that. Uh, I, I don't know what what they would object to. I mean, it's a really a nice, yeah. a, a nice mural, but um, you know. So I don't know any more than that. Uh, but John, Susan and her husband were there when, when, um, when it was dedicated. So yeah, it's, things are complicated. Who knows why? You know, they probably felt exploited. I think there's a question. Um, I, the m movie was very well done. The acting was really good, I thought. And um, one thing I'm wondering is um, if, if you could just mention some things that were Accurate or very um, not accurate. You know, if you sure. want to say anything about how much it's really real. Okay, he didn't go to the hospital in, in Portsmouth. He went to the hospital in Portland. Um, there's no evidence of him going out to the Isle of Shoals and saving anybody's life. Uh, he, when he first came to New Hampshire, he was in Gorham, and uh, he was in the Rotary Club and all of that up there. Um, had a positive experience passing for white. That worked out well for him. And then went to Harvard and then came back, having been the first person to go into that program. So what else? Um, so with Harvard, he went passing? But for a year, yeah, his whole family went. And so you know, he went into that program. I, I suspect he was passing there as well. But I, I, and I think there's a lot of truth to what Mel Ferrer says in the film when he says, I really did not want to pass, that I had to do that to support my family. You know, and that, that, makes, that makes sense, you know. Um, afterwards, Thyra, they, they really wanted the story to come out. Once, I think once certain people in the town turned on them and that got them out of the hospital, you know, and, and they felt terrible about the way it, it hit the children. The youngest son had a lot of mental problems over it. And as I mentioned, the second son, um, still was passing, would refuse to come to the event that we had. But, uh, but the state, of the, the governor of uh, New Hampshire at the time gave them a, a first family plaque and all this. It was, it was very touching. The NPR sent a reporter. It was, it, it, I did not expect anything like this. I figured we'd just show a film to the family and that would be it. I think they came to see Mel Ferrer, myself. You know, <laughs> and that was it. Um. Great film overall. Um, I had heard about it 
years ago, but never seen it. And I'm really proud that New Hampshire Humanities is showing it. I think it's great. Part yes, of the road thank show. you. Yeah. Um, but I guess my question slash observation in regards to the film is it's 1949, and obviously you're saying it was um, well received, revered, shown in many places, but from a preservation point of view and a historic point of view, I wonder how well known it is today and if part of that has to do with the race component because as we know, it's taken Hollywood a long time to open up to stories that aren't just about white families and white people and, and such. So I wonder, to close out, if you could talk a little bit about um, where it stands historically and why maybe it hasn't been as well known as, say, other films of that era, whether they deal with race or not. Great question, sure. When teaching film classes, I would point out to my students the difference between a, a, a significant film and a great, you know, and a great film. Um, uh, Birth of a Nation is one of the most racist films ever made. It's a great film technically, but it's an, an abhorrent, horrible film that caused the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. So you've got something that's a beautiful piece of work. You can't deny that. The same thing comes up with Lenny Riefenstahl's film about, you know, uh, uh, right, Triumph of the Will, that kind of thing. This film, Alfred Worker was uh, was a pretty conventional director. He he wasn't known for flashy style. He just did the job. So this film, I wouldn't call it a great film in that sense. Uh, Derochman had total control over the production of it, but it's a very very important film. That afterwards, I was getting letters from people saying, I, I remember this film when I was a kid. This is from African American folks. My parents went to see it. They, it was very well known among our community, is the way they, they would put it. And, you know, I hadn't even heard of it until Doris Wagner told me about it, you know. And then I started looking for information about it, and I found in, in, in film textbooks quite a bit. I mean, it. Um, yeah, it's a very, very important film, but that doesn't make it a great film. It makes it an important film. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes that distinction is kind of fine. Um, I can think of a lot of films that are important that uh, I wouldn't call great, but, you know, that kind of thing. Does that part kind of answer it yeah, uh, a little bit? Uh, yeah, thanks. It is. Uh, Amazon, I think it's 10 bucks. Um, Warner Brothers sells it. Yep, yeah, it is. And I, I'd, I, I'd surely like to say that we were going to be watching that half-hour documentary together. I think you would enjoy it. But, you know, in absence of that, please come up afterwards and take a look at some of these f pictures and stuff like that. And we can talk about the book if you want. I realize it's getting late. Um, any other questions uh, the, the, for, the, for the benefit of the group, for the benefit of the, of the community here? What is the documentary available for? Oh, I, yeah, that's a problem. Well, uh, we think the original has been located at the Historical Society of Cheshire County, uh, and they're trying to work with PBS to get it into formats more amenable to 2023, uh, but <laughs> that's a process. So we, we asked in PBS, said, NHPBS said we have to go look in our archives, and we sent them off on a, uh, a chase. Um, so we think we found the original in the Historical Society, but um, it's actually not super easily available at the moment. I have, I have it on DVD. But it's taken from a VHS tape I made off of television back in the day. <laughs> but but it, it, it won a regional Emmy. I mean, it was a good documentary. Fritz Weatherby, of course, introduces it. And, uh, and uh, if you haven't seen this film, it's a shame. You know how it is. Because here in this house right here is where this family lived. Yeah, he's, he's just awesome. Yeah, it's a, it's a good documentary because they interview everybody in it. It's worth seeing. Any other questions, or if uh, uh, I can wait down here for a little bit, if you know, uh, but he has anything to say? Oh, you're welcome. This is a great honor. Thank you very much.